We are honored to be joined by David Trout, Distinguished Professor of Law and Director of the Center on Law, Inequity, and Metropolitan Equity at Rutgers Law School in Newark. Thank you for joining us, Professor. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. By the way, the, the acronym is C-L-I-M-E? M-E, CLIMB, yes. CLIMB. Because it's, and, a, mouth, it's ahead, a mouthful sorry. otherwise. Yeah, and, and the mission of the uh, center is? So the mission of the center, it's an interdisciplinary center uh, doing impact research uh, in a, 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 across university units, but out of the law school. And the mission really is to focus on issues of structural inequality. And the reason that we, we sort of started in the law school is because that's my expertise. It's the framework for so many of the things that we look at. But there's no issue that we look at that doesn't involve institutions where the, the, the primary discipline is outside of law, whether it's healthcare or housing or urban planning or economics. So we're constantly working with affiliated faculty across the Rutgers campus. It's interesting, by the way, you speak about the Rutgers campus as a Rutgers alum, you know it well. Um, this series, Confronting Racism, a whole range of um, segments to it that you should look on our website and see, but this particular segment is done in cooperation with Rutgers State University and Rutgers, uh, Rutgers Newark, and particularly on behalf of Rutgers Newark. Let me ask you this, Professor. Confronting racism in 2021, what does it mean to you? It means finally reckoning with the uh, self-executing, self-reproducing dynamic that racism in this country has become in order to be so resilient, despite sporadic efforts to change it wholesale. So we are really looking at it not just as a systemic phenomenon, but as a structural phenomenon in the sense that racism is embedded in the norms, the practices, the rules, and the laws by which our key institutions operate. And by key institutions, I'm focusing primarily upon those that are responsible for a sense of opportunity. And so you can move down the line um, from policing to housing policy to healthcare, and the pandemic and this past year has demonstrated so many, so many ways to see it. But you, you see within our rules, within our norms, the various ways that, that, that people's systemic lack of reliable quality health care has helped to sort of cripple them in, in racially disproportionate ways so that when along comes this horrible virus, we see this incredible disparate impact. The same could be said of policing. The same could be said of, of, of employment systems now. How about well. housing? How about affordable housing? Well, affordable housing, I'm, I'm so glad that you asked because we're just about to release, you know, after about four months of research, an affordability assessment of the city of Newark. And um, housing is really probably one of the main repositories of so many uh, systemically racist rules and practices, both at the attitudinal level among individuals uh, as well as at the institutional level. And stay on that because there's a direct correlation between the housing crisis, affordable housing, and the fact that unemployment has gone up significantly in the city of Newark in the last year or so. It's gone from 7% before the pandemic to 17% now. Help people understand what that really means, Professor. I don't think they do. And, and I, I'm, I'm not even sure, frankly, that, that, that we understood it. I mean, I'm pretty involved in a lot of Newark politics, just in terms of, of local government decision-making, in helping to assist the, 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 the city in its, in its equitable growth principles and desire to sort of frame policy around that. And so we do a lot of talking about affordable housing. We know that it's a crisis. I don't think we knew the extent of the crisis. I mean, we've looked at this now, and having to sort of unpack the methodology, we've determined that in order to meet the need for affordable housing in the city of Newark, you would need to produce over 16,000 units of housing at about a rental, a monthly rent of $763. Now, the current median rent for the city is $1,100, and most affordability measures would 
would consider your housing at $1,200, $1,300, $1,400 dollars a month, consistent with federal guidelines of affordability. But for a city in which the median household income is only thirty thousand dollars, thirty thousand dollars—that's that's very low income. You know, it, we we just have to use a different measure. So when we think about that, we then realize that people simply do not have the resources. They're just not making enough money in the jobs that they hold. These are essential workers. These are retail workers. These are healthcare workers. These are, you know, school custodial workers for the most part who earn this kind of money. And, 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 and so when the pandemic hits, they're obviously in much more precarious situations. They're at risk of losing their jobs. What about the risk of eviction? And they're certainly at risk of eviction because what what it means to be stretched thin, the term in 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 social science uh, research is is rent burdened, meaning you're paying at least a third of your of right. your income pre tax income on on, um, on 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 your your housing costs. On housing, right. or severely rent burdened um, at at half, at more than half. Half of your income on housing. At least, at least half, and that's that's sixty percent of Newarkers pay pay um, um, at least uh, pay more than a third. So sixty percent are rent burdened, a third are severely rent burdened, paying more than half. So what does it mean? It means right that you're stretched thin. It means that you are foregoing other kinds of needs, but it also means that every dollar you make counts because you are paying so much more than you can afford to pay that there's no margin for error. And so in a pandemic, when people are losing their jobs at this rate or having their hours cut back or getting sick and not being paid for the period when they're out, they're at risk of losing their housing. And so we're seeing a massive increase in ejectments, which are when you lose your home, but you're there without a lease. So you are the person who had to go sleep right. on your cousin's couch and you were there for two months, the landlord found out and kicked you out. Or you are subject to eviction for non-payment. And while there's a moratorium until the end of March, you know, those we're not forgiving that back rent. So we will see come the spring the full fruits of this incredibly difficult time for so many families. Sorry for interrupting, Professor. By the way, I remind folks we're taping on February 16th. It'll be seen after that. By the way, Professor Trout is one of many academic scholars, researchers, folks at the Rutgers North community um, that will be working with us and providing expertise, insights, sharing their research. And so um, the first of many interviews, also check out our interview with Dr. Harry uh, uh, Perry Halkidis on a whole range of issues connected to uh, coronavirus. Um, Professor, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me, Steve. Take care. You got it. We'll be right back after this. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by PSE&G, the New Jersey Education Association, New Jersey Sharing Network, the Turrell Fund, supporting Reimagine Child Care, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, NJM Insurance Group, Johnson & Johnson, and by IBEW Local 102. Promotional support provided by CIANJ and Commerce Magazine, and by New Jersey Monthly. I could feel my lungs fill with oxygen, and I got my life back. The Sharing Network means to me hope, life, and everything. The Sharing Network was a lifeline to me when I really needed it. We are an organ procurement organization. The core purpose of the New Jersey Sharing Network is to save and enhance lives. To honor those who gave. A tribute to those who received. Offer hope to those who continue to wait. And remember the lives lost while waiting. For the gift of life.